And uh, last but not least, but to come here and tell us a little about some of the plans that Kaduna State has in store for you with regard to eliminating poverty, we have the Chief of Staff to the Governor, Mr. Muhammad Sani Abdullahi, also known as Daltijo. Please check your mics. Over to you, Aisha. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Let me just say, when I saw the panel that was on, I thought I had done something wrong to Lola because I read about everyone on the panel and I got a bit scared. And then when Malam entered also, I started, I was telling my friend, like, what is happening? So I feel a lot of pressure right now. <laughs> Um, but I also sighed when I saw this topic, eliminating poverty in the North, because there's so many angles and so many ways to look at it. And I feel like even if we were given four hours, we wouldn't exhaust it. So Northern, Ni um, let me start, Nigeria is the uh, poverty capital of the world, which means half of the population lives <coughs> under less than 700 Naira in a day. So there are people, half of Nigeria basically does not have 700 Naira to spend in one day. And then according to the NBS, the numbers are even worse in the north. So in terms of healthcare, literacy, the numbers are way worse compared to other regions. And so why we have this panel is just to look at those numbers, to talk about how we can use businesses to, to lessen those numbers, to make the economy of the north better, and to also see how we can get investors from outside the north to come in as well. I have a very competent panel, like I said, before to discuss this topic. I don't know if I should introduce you or would you like to, I think you should introduce yourselves. Let's warm up from the previous panel. So I'll start with you, um, Abubakar Suleiman. Please tell us who you are and what you do. Um, my name is Abubakar Suleiman. I've, I've um, been in the private sector for over 20 years and I've spent most of that working in financial institutions, specifically in the bank. Okay, Amal. My name is Amal Hassan. I'm the founder and CEO of Outsource Global. Outsource is a business process outsourcing company, basically a contact center that is serving three different markets, US, UK, and Japan. So for now, that's what you need. Okay, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. My boss, um, I'm under as much pressure as you, Aisha, um, <laughs> because I, I was hoping my boss wouldn't come. Wouldn't come. Now I think I have a second job interview. I feel I might be sacked tomorrow. <laughs> So I have to do extra well. My name is Mohammed Sani Abdullah. I'm a staff in the government house of Kaduna, and I work for the people of Kaduna State um, as the governor decides. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's get cracking. I'm going to start with you, Mohammed Sani, so I don't, I don't think you should put down the mic. Um, I think it's important before we talk about how to eliminate poverty from the north to even define what poverty is and what you think the causes of poverty are in the north, in relation to the north. I've been reading about you and you have a lot of think pieces and articles about poverty in the north. So I think you should tell us, what, if you had any theories for why the numbers are much compared to other regions, what would your theories be? Well, thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to start with saying thank you again to Kaba Fest for bringing us back. I think we did this last year and it was a similar panel with um, Abubakar um, where we had the opportunity to really talk about some of these issues. I think one of the main um, things that concern me regarding this topic is the fact that we still, as of yet, um, do not have a consensus around, like you said, what this means, um, the scale of it, and the strategies that we are trying to use to, to fix it. Um, Kabafest has been on for two or three days, um, and in all intents and purposes, the people in this room constitute the core elite of the northern uh, part of this country and other parts of this country. Um, to sit for three days talking about arts and books is something that only elites really can afford um, in, the, in our country today. So we are, and we have to accept that this is part of the core northern elite, but across the room, if you ask us um, for the different definitions of what poverty actually means, and how we should move ahead to actually address um, the question of eliminating poverty in North in Nigeria, you'd probably get as many answers as there are people in the room. So currently we have 
no consensus as elite on the problem. And this is the major part, I think, of the problem. Um, understanding and having a shared vision of what it is that we are trying to address is critical. And understanding it not just on the basis of generalities. It's very easy to say Nigeria is the poorest nation in the world. But if you say that you obscure, you obscure so many disparities across Nigeria, and as Aisha started saying, you know, a huge part of this poverty is in the north. But even when you stop at that, you're still obscuring huge parts of information. In the north where? If you say, for example, if it's the northwest, in the northwest where? When you say it's Kaduna or Kebi or Zamfara, where? I think until we are able to finish understanding all these issues and coming together through discussions like this to having a shared vision of what this actually means, first of all. Are we talking about income poverty? Are we talking about health poverty, infrastructure poverty, or all of them, or as multidimensional poverty as has been recently injected into the conversation? So I think it's very important. When I talk about, think about poverty, I think about it a lot from the multidimensional nature. Because if you go to our villages today, you might be income poor, right? But they have better food quality than sometimes even urban areas. So I think we need to look at it as a whole basket of access to healthcare, access to education, access to credit, infrastructure, you know, the levelers of society that allow the child of the poor to be able to climb up the ladder, to sit at these type of tables with us and be able to compete. These are the things that we really need to look at, uh, and I'm hoping that this panel can, can do some justice to that. Thank you. Okay, and that's, that's, that's why I started saying, even if we were given four hours, I don't think we'd be able to cover everything, because there's, there's just so much. So I'm going to go to you, um, Abubakar Suleiman, because I saw a video of you from 2018, um, CNBC Africa, and you maintained that, um, I don't know if you still share that view, that job creation is very important in, in in order to increase, uh, to better the economy, rather, of, of the North. And you specifically talked about it from the angle of banking. So I want to know if you still share that view and what your thoughts are on job creation in general. Okay, um, I'm going to go back to the view, but let me start by saying that poverty is a bigger problem for the rich than it is for the poor. We need to always understand that, because we often think that poverty is about the poor and what they're going through. It is about our position in society and how precarious it is if we don't do anything about it because the poor are so close to the bottom of the ladder that they have they don't have much to fall we are so far up here that when we start falling we won't believe what happens so it's important that we take it as this is about self-preservation um, the other comment I want to make about poverty or how to look at it is that at the other extreme of poverty is wealth so it is the lack of those things that define wealth that leads to poverty. A society creates a certain amount of wealth. Either the society does not generate enough wealth, and therefore some people will go without, or the wealth is so skewed that some go without, right? So those are the two things that I think will lead to poverty. In our case, I think we're faced with both of them. To create wealth, we combine inputs. It's the sim same as cooking a soup. And the input we combine are what we call land in the past, which is just natural resources. Um, we talk about labor or the input that comes from, from the workforce. And then we talk about capital, which is kind of borrowing some money to put in there. When any of this element is missing or when the entrepreneurship is missing, then you end up not creating enough wealth. So even if the society is equal, it will still be poor. That is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is where the society genuinely creates wealth but because the system of wealth distribution is so skewed that some people end up with so much and others end up with so little. Um, again, then you start to talk about the inequality and the Gini coefficient. Again, that can happen to any society. Uh, America today is a highly unequal society even though it creates wealth. What we need to deal with here, what I think is the fundamental thing for us to deal with, is how to create enough wealth by making sure that we combine those inputs in the right proportion. People talk about education being a fundamental issue. Yes, it is. People talk about access to finance, yes. But if you don't know what is the missing item, what you tend to do is that you put more input of what you think is missing and you don't get results. I think, for instance, that when we talk about education being a problem, we need to also understand that what we defined as education 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 
simply may not be the kind of education that creates jobs anymore. So if you continue to deliver the same kind of education, then you're still going to have poverty. Now, back to it, I still believe that the fundamental, the most important thing that we need to do as a society is to create more jobs for people. Every other thing falls from that. As I listen to the um, panel on, on feminism, I, I kept laughing to myself. Because there's one thing that we don't talk about when we talk about issues like feminism, is the role that poverty plays in that. Because we can have a very good conversation in this room and we'll understand feminism. Many of the guys here are going to go back and do the right thing. But when you move away to the rural areas where people do not have access to the basic things in life, they're not interested in your conversation about, because every, even the guy that is supposed to be the patriarchy is suffering, <laughs> right? So I go back to it, decent jobs. Creating jobs that allow people to have access to a decent life has to be the fundamental objective of any government. It can't be anything else. Okay, still, still on the issue of jobs, and uh, Amal, I'm going to come to you now. One of the recommendations from the World Economic Forum is to empower women. That if you empower women, you you are contributing to a better economy, especially in re relation to the North. And you have a history of doing that. I think it was in 2003, please correct me if I'm wrong, where you created an I IT center in Kano, and a lot of the focus was on women. And also, um, for Altos Global, I think you have a 50-50 ratio for women. Basically, you have a lot of emphasis on just empowering women. Was that deliberate on your part to foster, to Im improve the economy or to provide jobs for the women? I want to, I'm really interested in understanding why you felt it was important to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so like you rightly said, it, it, it's all of it. I started my first career with an IT training center in Kano. Uh, by 2005, we realized that we've trained a lot of IT professionals and we couldn't get them employed. And I started researching on what we could do to create employment in, in the North, basically, and in Nigeria. I stumbled on BPO, uh, Business Process Outsourcing. I looked at India and what they're doing and I realized that uh, business process outsourcing provided 2.2 uh, million jobs at the time that I was researching. And I told myself, why not Nigeria? So what is BPO? Companies in UK, US, and Australia, at the time that I was researching, now everybody does it, uh, outsource a segment of their business to a country where it's less, develo uh, less developed, where labor is very cheap. And they've been outsourcing to India for a long time. So I looked at the parameters and I said, this has created a lot of employment and nobody is looking at that region. I remember a lot of people thought I was mad because <laughs> nobody is doing it and there is no way a company in the US can outsource a segment of their business for a company in Nigeria to handle. So I, it took me eight years to start the company. I'm sure some of you know the stories. Um, it took me eight years. I started in Kano, I moved to Kaduna, started all over again, moved to Abuja, started all over again. We finally went live June 2016, and today Outsource creates employment for 850 people. Um, we serve, thank you very much. We serve, I'm coming to you, sir. I'm going to mention what we, you've done for us. Um, we serve companies in the US, we take lawyers, that serve uh, a legal firm in the US and they solve actual US cases. We have about 70 lawyers today that come into my center every day to work with senior lawyers in the US that, um, and uh, to solve actual US cases. We have medical people that deal with medical data. We have customer service. We do telemarketing. Hopefully Sterling Bank will be our client. Um, so we have different services, and uh, right now, since our focus is actually employment and creating employment, we try to focus on the women, because what we realize is when you bring people for employment, a lot of us don't look at the soft issues. I always take myself on as an example. It will take Lola to force me to come into the stage to talk, right? So what I do is when we are interviewing, we try to make people as comfortable as possible, especially women, to see that we bring out the best out of them, even from employment. So what we did is we created what we call our four core values. Um, sincere honesty and integrity, making an impact, constantly improving and insisting on higher standard. For us to compete with the international market, 
we have to we have to you know um, work according to the international market I mean international standard so what we've done from day one is if you have those those four core values we bring you in so that automatically makes it easier for the women to come in that's one and when there's a room for for promotion we also look at those issues first before we look at how you talk how you are confident and how you know we, we, we look at delivery so automatically one day we realize that we have currently today our source has 60 percent women not 50 but I keep it at 50 because sometimes uh, because of working with the US market and we have to work according to their time so uh, the number is co uh, constantly um, uh, fluctuating so to your question we've done I have done a lot to look at women and to see how I can promote them in our company based on the way I am and how I was when I was growing uh, through that so if we can do that it will really make a lot of difference. Um, in 2017, I was approached by uh, the government of Malam to come and set up in Kaduna. That's our second um, oh yeah, I need to take water. My mouth is dry. That's our second center. And Kaduna was my second attempt. And I was brought back into Kaduna. In t and it's one of the best things that have happened to outsource. Because at the time, my focus is the north, but I couldn't establish in the north because the infrastructure is, is not there. Everybody that is investing would actually choose Abuja as a preferred investment uh, 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 destination. So when we opened Kaduna, it opened us to a lot of donor agencies who decided to promote us, which at the time that I came to Kaduna, we had 350 seats. Today, outsource because of that, we have 850. So if governments look at that, look at companies, young companies that are coming up, young entrepreneurs that are coming up, and, and give them a little bit of push, it will really go a long way in creating employment. So I'm going to stop at this. OK, interestingly, you what you just said about the government is what I want to ask um, Mohammed. So, so Mohammed, um, there's there are a lot of debates that say that it's not the job of the government to provide jobs or to improve the economy. That the government is just supposed to provide, give an enabling environment for jobs to thrive. And we know a lot of the time with the private sector that they're mostly after perhaps their own interest, profits. And if the environment is not stable, there's no reason why they should stay. So, I want to know, like. What are the things that the government can do or should do to make the environment better for businesses and investors to thrive, especially in relation to the North? Thank you very much, Aisha. Well, I mean, from our experience, the government can do significant um, amount of support. Um, I'll, and I'll tell you a short story. In 2014, um, while um, we were campaigning um, uh, to run for the elections, while the governor was campaigning, Kaduna was known as a civil service state. Um, everywhere you go, people would say Kaduna is a civil service state. Now, what that essentially means is that the less than 100,000 people that work for the state public service, both state and local government, are the only people that have any income in the state. We have 9 million people in Kaduna, approaching 10, but less than 100,000 people were the people controlling the economy. Now, these people were all public officials, civil servants, all earning a salary of less than, the highest salary is maybe three, 400,000. The governor earns about, am I okay to say, sir? <laughs> the governor earns about 600,000 naira, okay? So the highest salary. Now everybody else depends on this group of 100,000 and less across a state of nine million. There is no way you can eradicate poverty you can achieve economic opportunity with that kind of structure. And the government successively have been okay with that because it's fine, as you know, when everybody has to come to you to sit down and ask you for some help and support. And that structure was fine. Now that was the first thing that we saw as a huge anomaly in the structure of Kaduna State. 
Now, I fast forward you in 2017, and people that um, come to some of uh, the thing, events I participate in probably know this story. But I want to say it again. In 2017, I went to a state, uh, a place in the US called Seattle. Many people don't know where Seattle is. Maybe you've heard about Sleepless in Seattle, the movie. But I mean, beyond that, people usually don't ever know that there's a place called Seattle in the US. Even for people that stay in the US, they ignore it. Seattle is one third of Washington state. So it's like a senatorial district, right? It's big. When I was going there, I wasn't really interested because I hadn't done any prior research. I just had a meeting and then I was going to fly out. But when I went there, I was just dumbstruck because Seattle is the headquarters of Boeing. It is the HQ of Amazon, Wikipedia, Microsoft, right? Now, when I got to Seattle, Amazon had just put out a hire for about, they were going to hire about 30,000 engineers. And that was one of their slowest years, 30,000 engineers. None of them earning less than $200,000 a year. There is no con co company today in Africa, I don't think, that is hiring 30,000 engineers, paying them $200,000 a day, none. Now, this was just Amazon. Now, because of that, the real estate market of Seattle had completely changed. High rises everywhere, young, the school, um, parks. You know, because of that one company, Amazon, Microsoft was there, Gates Foundation is there. So you can almost taste the prosperity when you're walking down the street. Nobody cares who the governor or mayor of Seattle is. Nobody cares. The reason why we care here is because he's the only person that controls everything. And so we started a deliberate strategy in 2015. I think the first law that we sent to the House of Assembly was to create the Investment Promotion Agency of Kaduna, Kaduna Investment Promotion Agency, which is headed by my sister Uma here. And that investment drive and focus has been our focus all through. So this, regardless of all the stories that you hear about Kaduna, unsafe, kidnapping, blah, Every single day we're pushing investments every day. Just yesterday there's a major big one, which hopefully, I mean, I think down the line we would announce. But there are a lot of things that are happening despite everything. And it's because we understand. Can I, can I come in quickly? Yeah. So, I'm so sorry to interrupt you because I'm really particular about the specific things yeah. that can be done to promote these investments. Okay. I know you, you've, you've given context, but I want to know those yeah. things that will help businesses okay. grow that the government can do. So, so just quickly, the, I mean, again in 2014, Kaduna was the worst place to do business in the north, which is really like the worst place to do business in Nigeria. Last, this, earlier this year, we won the first, first place to do business World Bank worldwide. I mean, in terms of Nigeria, this is the world wor worldwide ranking not a Nigerian ranking. Because of the efforts every single day to remove the barriers to investment. I mean, I think a few years ago, many young people in Kaduna were content with, many young people in Kaduna were content with, I'll go to school and get a job. But we've introduced so many training programs, entrepreneurship training programs, in Kaduna, starting with Kaduna Startup Entrepreneurship Program, all the way up to now, um, click on Kaduna. Then the, the atmosphere has changed. If you see young people today, they're involved in one business or the other. We believe very strongly that that young crop of people are the ones that will power this economy and provide the jobs. People like Amar that we have, we hunt down and we look for, and we ask, what do you need? We take away the constraints to business. Amal, I mean, locates in our ICT, co-locates in our ICT hub. I don't think she's paying any rent, is she? I don't, I hope not. <laughs> but, I, but I mean, these are some of the constraints that you have to follow investors to remove. So we actually sit down with them and say, what are your constraints to setting up in control? Because we look very long term. And over the past three or four years, you can see major announcements in Kaduna. If, you come, if you're coming from uh, Abuja, for example, by road, you're bound to have come across Olam, which is becoming like another traffic stop there because of the number of trailers that are there. That's business. That is a city coming up right there. Opposite Olam is where Dangote is setting up the new Pujo. 
If you go into town, there's um, the Mahindra Tractor Assembly Plant. We've got the ICT Hub. There's so much happening. And our young people are being trained in their thousands. So we're hoping that the, this development is not just for today. It's for the next five years, next 10 years, where we're bringing out entrepreneurs that are really making a dent in the mark in the global space in Nigeria. Okay. So you've talked about some of the roles that the government has to play in helping um, businesses. Um, I'm going to come to you now, um, a, 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 a worker. Um, what about the role of the private sector and banking, especially in relation to access to finance? And I don't just mean for SMEs now. Even for individuals, perhaps a farmer who wants to do something on his farm, what, what role uh, does banking have to play there? Okay. Um, let me start by saying that the most important thing the government can do for the private sector is in their body language. Uh, when you walk into a room and you're not wanted, you start to look for s the way out. So the best thing Kaduna has done is that it is clear to everybody that they are very welcoming of the role of pri pri private sector in building uh, the state. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, before I go again into banking, um, let me clarify. There are many instances where access to finance actually becomes a problem rather than a solution. So we're very careful in thinking that just merely throwing finance solves the problem. I think in Kenya right now it's becoming a crisis because of the access to credit and the fact that people are over leveraged. So it's important to balance it. However, that said, um, Nigeria suffers from a particular problem where the total savings in the economy relative to the GDP is one of the lowest in the world. So we don't have a history of saving money, we haven't put money aside, and there could be any number of reasons, but the reality is that you don't have enough even to start a business. Yeah. Whereas in many economies, you do have enough to start a business that you now leverage on banking. So we need to solve for more than just banking uh, debt finance. Uh, that's one problem. What can we do as bank, as a bank, um, and hopefully I can tie that, to, tie that to another Nigeria. We need to look at those who need to access finance and help them understand the other components that are required before financing can come in. So more often than not, the other components are missing. Take a good example, you run a business. Your business has no governance, it means that one person decides everything and you walk into a bank to get finance, you're not going to get that finance. Those are the simple things that if you don't put in place, no matter how many times you go to a bank, you don't get financing. Um, you don't keep your records. Sounds simple, but a lot of people run a business and it's all in their head. At that point, you're going to get money from your family and your friend. You're not going to get money from a bank. So the number one rule we need to do is to engage the society so that they understand the relevance of their own role in accessing finance. That said, and specifically for Northern Nigeria, we have not invested enough in two things that are important. One is in expanding the channels for access to finance. So if you go to a lot of the Northern states, you're lucky if you have a banking branch in the capital. Maybe the top two cities might have a bank branch. When you go out of there, all the other local government, there is no presence of a bank. So the idea that the bank exists to support them, it doesn't even cross their head. So they're used to different methods. And that is something that people can be motivated to do something about. However, the bigger problem, and it's one that is not obvious, is that there are not enough people from this part of the country in financial services. It may be a subtle issue, but the reality is that when we try to hire people into banking in northern Nigeria, we actually struggle. We find ourselves hiring people from other parts of the country and sending here. Now, you don't realize that until you start to look at the data, then you realize that while over 30% of the deposit in the banking system is from northern Nigeria, we're struggling to get 10% of the loans here. And don't forget, it is the loans that create economic activity. It is the loans that form part of the input for um, how we get to create jobs. So again, these are the subtle issues that I would like to mention. Coming to Sterling and what we do, a full banking business by building a huge bank branch. By the time you pay for the building, the kind of money you need to charge the villagers to make profit, you can't. So you use a network of agents. And we've built an agent network that is over 15,000 now. We're trying to keep scaling that across the country. The benefit of an agent network is that the people live in the same community, they understand everybody in there, they know who is a good credit and who is not. Now, most investment in micro uh, financial inclusion has been focused on merely capturing the money of the people, and very little has focus has been placed on giving money back to the society. 
that is a difficult thing to do, but there are existing um, communal network that you can use to give um, credit to people, and these are microcredit. What we've done, and we've we started in Lagos, and we are now coming to in Kaduna and Kano. What we've done is to focus on giving money to um, pay rent for the purpose of paying school fees. In fact, we pay the school fees. So that microcredit going into private sector education, where we tried it, has significant impact, not just for the kids going to school or the parents, but also for the entire community. We saw communities being um, rejuvenated because of this microcredit, right? So that is specific to not. The other part of it is that we as a bank have decided to focus on five sectors. We chose those sectors carefully because we realized the impact of those sectors um, on the economy and therefore the sustainability of lending to those sectors. Uh, we call it the heart of sterling and it's health, education, agriculture, renewable energy and transport. When you look at them deep down, if you can cure for these five things, any society that can solve for these five is already a prosperous society. Every other thing will come as a follow-up. Uh, and we have a unique advantage in northern Nigeria. We have all the land that we need. We have, believe it or not, more water resources than we realize. We just don't harvest them enough. We have the human resources we need. When you move from agriculture and you move into uh, renewable energy, for instance, um, one of the, I think the second best place for solar energy in the world is actually somewhere in Kano. So this place is ripe to harvest the energy of the sun, to drive not just um, the manufacturing sector, but also to drive quality of life. And then you know we have a crisis in education right now in northern Nigeria. Therefore, again, this is an opportunity for us not just to try and bring the famous 10 million kids on the street, or but to redefine education so that we can do it cheaper, faster, and we will do it at the most rural uh, place without taking the next five years to prepare. So it's an opportunity. Yes, we have a critical problem, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, and then obviously down to transport. Obviously, when you have agriculture as your mainstay, you must have material investment in transport. So yes, we are focused on those sectors. So transport, healthcare, literacy raise, and, and all of that, they're, they're uh, and Amal, this is for you, they're long or mid-term solutions. I, I want to know, as based on your experience as someone who has been in business for a very long time, what are the type of businesses or jobs that people are interested in at the moment that can somewhat take them out of poverty. I know not completely, but these solutions that we have been talking about, these things are long-term solutions. So what can we tell the person who sells something on the streets? What, what kind of business or help can we offer them pending the time that these long-term solutions you know, bear their fruits? What, what, just, I want to know what your thoughts are based on your business experience. So, so, so the people on the street, the person selling Akara, may have university education. Mm. One of the things I discovered when we started Outsource is you can find people with master's degree that are building houses, uh, that are carrying cement on their head. So, so, so the first thing is to find out, those people, are they educated? If they're educated, test them. They can do anything. They're looking for any kind of job. So when I've, we've, we don't pay for advertisement, actually. We, we, we started paying for jobberman very, very, job very recently. Once we advertise a, a job on our website, we have tons and tons of people. And when they come for interviews, you find out that a lot of them are qualified. A lot of them have finished school a long time ago and are doing all odds, a lot of jobs, you know, just to survive. So the first thing is the educated people that are working on the streets trying to get jobs. How do we get them employed? There are jobs requirement internationally and everywhere in the world where the, the uh, labor is very cheap here. So we call it cheap here. Uh, we, they call it cheap, but to us it's not cheap. So they require those services. So what I found out in outsource is there is no skill that is required internationally that is not available in Nigeria. Our lawyers, <laughs> I, 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 I always give reference to our lawyers. Our lawyers are very, very good lawyers. 
where we have highest we, we have the highest percent rating when it comes to the legal campaign that we have a lot of the clients that we serve move their operations from philippines and india to us why because we have better accent than india if you look at myself as an example i've never studied anywhere but kano i went to an arabic school in kano primary i went to a federal school fggc kazori and i went to Bayero university kano and i speak in a way that when an american picked a call will think that, okay, maybe she's here, maybe she's somewhere close to here, right? So we have the best accent. In terms of IT support services, we have very good, it's not just IT, legal, all the campaigns that we serve, our international client, are very, very good. We're able to compete with international market. So the first thing we need to do is identify those skills and channel those skills to where it's needed. It may not be here because there are no companies enough to give jobs for the people that are here. But if government like Malam, just the way they supported me and said, okay, uh, l let me just clarify that. I was called by, I was told to come and meet with Malam. One time he was traveling and they asked me, what can we do to make you come and establish your center in Kaduna? And I told them, build a building that is purpose-based built for the kind of services I offer. And they ask me, bring the specification of that building. And they build it according to my specification. What I did is I brought in my technology, which was easier, <laughs> and I established my third center, not second. I forgot that I have Lagos at the time they approached me. So this kind of support goes a long way because I didn't think I could establish the third center until, you know, that cost was eliminated completely. So these are the things that we need to identify. We need to identify what are the low-hanging fruits. The low-hanging fruits are the educated people. We have a lot of them looking for jobs. I have an employee of mine that earns 60,000 Naira. Every month, he sponsors somebody in his village to start a business. And today he is four months old in my center, and he has sponsored 10,000 10, naira every month for somebody to start a business. His rule is just one. None of his, his, his beneficiaries can compete with one another. So the first one is doing is frying yam. The second one is going to start uh, uh, a plumbing um, services. The third one is going to, you know, so I don't know what the third one and fourth one, I stopped following up with him. So, 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 so you can imagine how much jobs he is creating in his village. So what we need, what we need to do as government and private sector is to look at the low hanging fruits. We have a lot of people that are employed, start with them first. Then the unskilled, the, the uneducated, we have to look at the way Kaduna State is creating uh, training for people that are, are are not educated. So we have mechanics, we have, uh, I know there was a time that one World Bank agency was uh, trying to create, uh, uh, train people in, in all those kind of jobs. So what we need to do as a government, I talk too much, should I continue? <laughs> <laughs> so what we, we should do as a government is to create an agency that has a listing of those people that are not educated, that are trained under World Bank, or I, I forgot the name of the program. Uh, there's a program, yeah. Uh, so, so a lot of people in Kaduna would like a plumber. When I was living here, that was a major problem. A plumber, electrician, and all that. So the rule should be, you can get qualified electricians, you can get qualified plumbers from this agency. They are registered, they are secure, they are this, they are not kidnappers. So, uh, <laughs> yes, so, so people like me can come and say, okay, I will, I, will, I will only take from this agency. So you have created, you've trained them, and you've created jobs for them. So there's so many things that uh, when I go uh, internationally, I see government doing, India and all those governments that are not too far from us, but we can actually be better than them doing. And I come back home and I look at it and I say, this is simple, this can be done. 
So I think those are the low hanging fruits. Yeah. Okay. So can someone from the team please just let me know when we have 20 minutes more? I Oh, we have 20 minutes more. Okay. I was so nervous I forgot to bring my phone so I don't have the time. Um, just as a way to round up, le Mohammed, let me ask you, especially in relation to budget, alloca budget allocation for these very important, um, I, I guess, sectors that we've identified the need to invest in. So there are a lot of policies in place. I, that's why I didn't even want to ask about policies. I think a lot of the problems are just implementing those policies. So can you just tell me about how, how um, moving the budget can help investment in certain um, sectors that are needed to develop and how policies can be better implemented because I know they exist they're just not fully efficient thank you very much um, I think with regards to policies it's important that we continue to talk about them because that is what continues to form the basis of the consensus that we all need to have in the room so when we talk about eliminating poverty at least the three of us here have a shared understanding, or four of us have a shared understanding, and then we can bring everybody else in the room along with us and say, look, we need to do these five or six things, right? Because the problem of not having those five or six things is that we keep on changing the strategies, and because we have such limited resources and so many problems, if you keep changing the strategy, you never get to the solution. That is why this shared consensus is important. And it, it is the role of the elite in any society to come along a shared understanding of how we need to progress. So it's the policies are important and we continue to articulate them and we continue to have them as um, different sectoral pieces. The financing of it is a bit different. Today, if you look at um, Nigeria as a whole, um, we are in quite serious financial um, status. We are spending about 70% of our revenues to service our debts. Um, that is before we pay um, the salaries of public servants. And then we have to borrow um, to implement any capital projects as a country. Now it's different state by state. There are some states that are doing a bit better. There are states that are much worse. For example, what Kaduna makes in a, in a month is what Zamfara makes in a year. What Kaduna makes in a year is what Lagos makes in a month. So, so you can see that the disparities are huge. And that's why whenever we come to a conversation like this about eliminating poverty, first of all in Nigeria, and then in northern Nigeria, and you continue to go down, it is very important that we contextualize it to the realities of those different locations. If you look at, for example, the issue around maternal mortality, the number of women that die when they come to give birth to a child, the national average obscures a lot of disparities across the country. Nationally, I think we're about 90 women per every 1,000. So if 1,000 women give birth, 90 of them die. But what this does not show is actually, in the Southwest, only 15 die. In the Northwest, 110 die. So we need to look at these issues very, very closely. When we did our own in Kaduna, because we're very interested in finding out, OK, in Kaduna, how does it come down? In Kubo, local government, we have the highest number of women that die due to childbirth. If you go to Kachia, it's much lower, right? So I think these things are very important for us to take into consideration as we continue to form the strategy. Now, back to the budget. We have um, financial um, problems as a country. That is translated down to states. There are many states today in Nigeria that are not able to pay the salaries of their workers. So at this point in time, you have to ask yourself, is government created to pay salaries of public servants or to deliver the public good to the wider number of its population? 
As I mentioned to you, there are 100,000 people working for the government of Nigeria, uh, of Kaduna, 9 million people in Kaduna State. So when you come to talk about resources, how should these resources be spread? Should it be 8.9 million people getting 90% of the resources, or 100,000 people getting 90% of the resources? These are real questions, right? Because as of today, our country is spending more than 70 to 80% of the leftover after debt servicing to pay the machinery of government, right? So if you come down to the bare bones of the budget and you find out that there's no money left to do health care, there's no money left to do education or to provide the infrastructure that is necessary for people like Amal to do their business or Sterling Bank to do its business, then we have an issue. So we have to come around the table because these are debates that you have every day as government. You are thinking, do I start with prioritization of social investments, right? Or do I create the environment, spend the money to build a mouse hospital so that she can hire 800 more people? These are real discussions. Should I take my money to Kubau to save 10 more women? Or should I provide jobs for 600 more people? Because the resources are finite. Should I approach Sterling Bank in their heart, right, to take money for the health, the education, right, the agriculture? So, so these are some of the things that we deal with on, on a daily basis. And you have to really um, take a position on, on where you want to go as a, as a state. Just to uh, uh, round up, we have That's a- 30 seconds. Yes, 30 seconds. We have a population issue. Right? We don't like to talk about it, but we have a population issue. There's a huge advantage for, for politicians because the more population, the more votes. But when I meet people inside Kaduna and they say, you're doing nothing, as a government, you guys are doing nothing, I say, I agree and I accept, we apologize. And then I see other people that meet us and say, you guys are doing so much. And I say, I agree. Because the population is so much and the problems are so many that whatever you do is like a drop in the ocean. We have built 255 hospitals. We go back and we clap for ourselves, clap for the health commissioner. In reality, we need 3,000. So we haven't done really anything. And this is how it percolates for education, for water, for all the other sectors. So it's really a conversation that we need to continue having and to really chart a path that all of us as elite understand that whoever is, a, is the governor, regardless of who it is, will face these problems and we need to have that solution um, together. Thank you very much. So because of the time, I'm going to let the two of you answer the same question. I'm moving a little bit. I want to know the role of, the role technology has to play in reducing poverty in, in the north. So if you can answer that very briefly, one minute, that'll be really nice so that we can do the Q&A. So I don't know who wants to go first. Yes, I'm absolutely gonna answer that, but not before saying that government should create jobs, but government should create the kind of jobs that creates other jobs. Wow. So for every job that government creates, they should target nice. at least five jobs. <laughs> the second point I must also make is that um, our biggest challenge is called productivity. So yes, we have an unemployment challenge, but the truth is that even those who are, who are employed, because they don't have the right infrastructure, they don't produce enough. And because they don't produce enough, government can't get enough taxes to solve all that problem. So a lot of what government is doing is to improve productivity. Now, that takes me straight into technology. The opportunity for that technology offers is for us to circumvent the long and arduous path to growth. The, it would normally have taken 50 years, for instance, to move from where we are to um, achieving what is the average for Africa today, because we're actually below Africa in many of the parameters. But that can be done in two years, can be done in five years, because of technology. Um, Education is a, an area where technology plays a very critical role. We can educate, not just for people getting certificate, for the skills they need to be employed. We can do that. Technology is the reason why she is creating jobs today in Nigeria to serve people all over the world. So absolutely, it plays an important role. We we'll probably can't finish that conversation today. Do you, do you want to add anything? 
Yeah. Okay, so he has said it all. Technology made, made it possible for me, a girl that is brought up in Kano from a conservative or, or traditional house or home, to think of setting up a contact center that can service the international market. So that's technology. Technology is what made outsource possible to create 850 direct jobs within three years of operations. Without technology, there is no way. Calls can be routed from US to Nigeria, and somebody in Nigeria can pick and say, oh, the weather in Seattle is really, really hot today. So, 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 so that's, the technology is what will change the world and what will change Nigeria. I always say if government focuses on technology alone and technology enabled services, we will change this country. Thank you. Okay, so we have just 10 minutes, which means there are rules. Please, no comments. Just ask your question. I'm so sorry, but if you're commenting, I will cut you off. Ask your question in one minute. Uh, I'm going to try to pick from here. Okay, let me start. This girl, you've had your hands up for a while, so can you please give her the mic? Yes. Good day, everyone. All protocols duly observed. Please, my question. You said we need to create decent jobs. So I'm wondering, what exactly is a decent job? Can't I do something, and I'm sure that this is a decent job, and then people pay for it, and people appreciate it, and people don't feel, OK, you studied building engineering. Why are you doing this? You should do better. But it can't go around, and I'm trying to create a decent job for myself. And then everyone says, ah, this is not decent. So what indeed is a decent job? Thank you. OK, let's take another one before you. Um, the girl in the blue hijab, Farida. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is particularly about the Amajiri system. I want to know, I'm passionate about it. I'm, I want to state that I am not an advocate of abolishing it at all. It doesn't solve the problem. So I want to know, are there structures Kaduna State Government is putting in place to help these children? Because um, Quranic um, knowledge enough is not enough for them alone. So is there a plan to put them in mainstream education as well and help their parents as well so that they gain skills that will help them come out of poverty? Thank you. Um, can we get it to the guy in, I don't know what that color is, God. Um, the guy brown, next to the guy wearing brown. Yes. You, yes, you looking down, that's you. Can you get him the mic, yes. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Sani Musa Ibrahim from Ahmadu Bell University, Zaidia. Um, Some times back, I was reading the newspaper, and I came across with an article where the auto was seeing an eye cut. There is nothing more common in the northern states, in the ni northern Nigerian states, like other than poverty. So it's really made me, so, so it, it was surprising. And then now I'm asking this question. Is the government having any plan, I mean the northern government, is it having any plans of coming together to unanimously and objectively create solutions for this talent? And my other question is this. I am, as the main challenges, from my own perspective, the major challenge that um, entrepreneurs do face is financing. And that's for upcoming entrepreneurs, financing is a major challenge. As a student now, I've participated in a lot of events, a lot of competitions, and I've not won anyone, believing that winning a competition can make me bring my idea into life. So now, you are successful entrepreneurs, what do you have to offer us? What, um, advice do you have to offer to us upcoming entrepreneurs to overcome this challenge of financing thank okay, you i'll take one more the guy at the back with the locks he's had two hands up for a while um. thank you um i've really learned a lot from everything you've been saying but then i feel so sad that i'm an artist my name is Ocha Ogaba. i feel so sad that nobody has said anything about the art industry and I just want to point out that we, we actually exist, and I think we underestimate, I think we underestimate our possibilities. And uh, the mommy there in the middle, sorry, I can't remember your name. Um, she, she spoke about um, technology being the future of the world. I say art is the future of the world, and I want to know why you're not really looking at um, um, 
uh, investing into the arts and the creative industry because uh, one of the major challenges that we're even having in the North is the fact that we're very creative people, but we don't have professional backups. We do not have like an artist management industries, um, companies or agencies, and nobody's helping us. We don't even understand how to go into the business of art. Okay, and okay, yeah. okay. So let me just, um, I, I don't know, the decent job question, was he, who was it addressed to? Okay, yeah. please just try to answer in a minute. Yeah, no, so there are actually three, I can take out three. Decent job is not defining the work actually, defining the quality of life you are able to live because you work. Because we feel that if you have a job and you cannot take care of your basic need, that's not a decent job. So whatever job can be a decent job, but it has to cater for your basic needs. Um, access to finance, uh, that I would take because the reason, so every single day that we wake up as bankers, we wake up with billions of naira, and the only thing we want to do with that money is to find the right person to give it to. So when we're not giving it out, it's because there is a gap between what you think you need to do and what we think you need to do. So you need to really sit down, begin to understand what you need to have in place before you can access financing. Um, but just to really, really uh, close that nicely, banking gives you a loan when you are an entrepreneur and you are starting a business. That's not the money you need. You need an equity, you need an investor. You need somebody who is going to join you in taking the first set of risk. Banks are not designed to do that. So you must first, most people will go to friends and families and people they know first, so that by the time you go to a bank, you have a track record, and that track record will then make it easy for you to uh, get finance. So just to summarize, please start with equity, talk to those who trust you the most and believe in you, and keep a very good record, so that when you come into a bank, your record will be the basis for you accessing financing. Mohammed. Um, and sorry, because we've done a lot in the creative industry, I'm going to say to you, you're absolutely wrong. We don't think creative is something to be underestimated. We think it's a huge part of the future for job creation in this country. Um, and the banking industry has come together to put together, yeah, yeah it, it's actually, there is a fund that the banking industry has put together running to billions of Naira that we are spending to create infrastructure for creatives and we're looking to all over Nigeria, but we're also making that funding available for people from the creative sector that are looking for uh, financing to take their business forward. So we're not underestimating creatives at all. We just didn't have enough time to talk about it. Uh, okay, Mohammed, do you want to address the question on al the Almajri system and what the government is doing? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the uh, Almajri problem is both a complicated and a simple problem. Um, it's a complicated problem with a simple solution, I think. The issue about Almajri is out, same thing as the out of school um, children that we have. And it's really about education. But at the back of that is the whole economic issue as well of poverty. We, I mean, if you walk around Kaduna today, particularly in the night, or you stop to buy suya, um, you are likely to be um, thronged by one or two of these young, um, I make it a habit to sit down and ask questions. And you would hear about the architecture of how this thing actually works. Every single month you mop up and you redirect to schooling a number, huge number of these young children, you have much twofold coming in again from other parts of the country and indeed externally. So it's an issue that cannot be solved by just one state, and it's an issue that has been on the agenda of the Northern Governors even at the last meeting that we had. So there is a lot that's being done, but it requires an effort from the entire leadership of the region, and it is not just one. But I can guarantee you that if you just stop today, if you're accosted by any, take five or 10 minutes of your time and listen to their story. You will hear that, okay, we came in last week or we came in last month. So no matter what we do uh, to mop up these ones, there's another batch that is in. And it, you cannot stop um, the free flow of, of movement. So it's a problem that we need to tackle um, holistically, very similar to the security issue. Uh Oh, okay, so um, we don't have time, but I want you to respond to, he asked about advice for entrepreneurs. So what, what, what would you advise an upcoming entrepreneur? Okay, so my advice to you is there's no clear cut to how you can get financing, really. One of the reasons why we started outsource four times and failed and kept on going was because one, the issue of finance, two, the issue of 
um, I don't want to get into trouble, people pushing you out of your business. The, so there are so many issues. So what I always tell young entrepreneurs is keep on trying. You have an idea that you feel is a very good idea and you know you can, you can get it out there. Keep on trying until you get it. So um, a lot of people feel that is, is, is really simple. One of the major issues of business is not actually finance. Even when you get the financing, how do you stand out? How do you compete against the best? How do you be, how can you be the best? Those are the things you should be worried about. The first advice was given by um, Abu Bakr is um, um, start with your family and friends. That's where I started. And then when you do that, make it in such a way that it counts. So, um, um, make it in such a way that it counts in the sense that every documentation, every record, um, every delivery is based on professionalism. Right from day one, we insisted on higher standard. We did not compromise on quality. And the best way to get your business stand out is to make sure that from the delivery to the quality to the security man, to where people are sitting, to the manner and way they, they actually do your business is actually done professionally. A lot of people don't take, take, uh, take that for granted. So once you do that with the money that family and friends give you, yes, there will be a lot of people that will want to invest in you. We have, I outsource today, have outsourced global, not the other initiatives that I started and failed, have, have not collected one single loan from any bank today. Even though I'm going to. Thank, thank you so much. I think <laughs> we're yeah. completely out of All time. Right. Thank you. So we can take Thank more you very much. much. A huge round of applause. <laughs> thank you so much, Aisha. Thank you, Abu Bakr. Thank you, Amal. And thank you, Mahal.